This is my mother's family, it's considerably a larger group. Uh, the picture was taken in 1911. Of all these people, only one is still alive. It is, not surprisingly, the infant, known as Louis Seichmann, who is still alive, but only barely alive, in Bangkok, Thailand. He is now some 83 years old. Let's now look at the picture as a whole. I think it's not hard to guess that the matriarch of this family is this little woman. Her name was Haifega. Haifega, it's a hyphenated name, Haifega. She was indeed the matriarch. Both of her sons uh, had uh, legal or quasi-legal training, but both were basically in the palm of her hand and uh, somewhat afraid of her. This is at least the story I always got from my mother. Now, my grandfather is this man. He had some legal training. He never went to law school. He did not go to law school because at that time he would have had to convert to Christianity to be accepted in law school, and he wouldn't do that. He received the training of a notary public. A notary public in those days in Russia, as indeed in most countries in the world today, was a much more important person than a notary public in the United States. It was a full-time job. He drew up contracts and uh, other legal documents in addition to signing as notary for the validity or it, uh, of signatures or the original uh, nature of documents and so on and so forth. And this was his wife, Miriam. This was the other son of Haifega. I have no idea, incidentally, where, when Haifega's husband died, or who he was, or what he was. He, too, had some legal training, and he, too, engaged in sort of quasi-legal practice. And this was his wife, whose name I, at the moment, do not recall. Now, in this picture, all the younger people are the offspring of my grandfather, Tzvi in Hebrew, Hirsch in Yiddish, which is a literal translation of Tzvi, and means, of course, a deer, and Grigori in Russian. From Tzvi to Hirsch by literal translation, from Hirsch to Grigori by uh, rough phonetic equivalence, Hirsch Grigori. And lots of the Harveys and Howards and so on in America today are actually also Hirsch's and therefore Tzvi's. These were his children then. The oldest was Joseph, who later emigrated to the United States, lived in San Francisco for many years, and in the process of emigration, passing through Poland, acquired the Polish spelling of Sigmund, which, however, once reaching Anglo-Saxon mouth, became Sigmund, C-Y-K-M-A-N. So that's why we had Sigmunds and Sigmunds in the family. I think the next in age, or maybe even older than Uncle Joseph, was this woman. Her name was Adele, or Adele in Russian. I don't believe she had a Hebrew or a Yiddish name, which was, in interestingly enough, not surprising because of partial racification of this family, as against my father's family. They would give names also to their children, which did not stem from any Hebrew original names or the Bible or anything like that, but which would be Western names, for example, Adele in this case. And then, uh, also among the older children, is uh, this lady, uh, Lisa or Elisaveta, Elizabeth, this one here. Uh -huh. okay. I'll later say something about their ultimate fates. Then, sort of in the middle of uh, this group of children, is this man. This man is uh, Lou Louis Zickman, or Zickman, 
about whom we shall hear a great deal, because he played a very large role in the future history of the family, and particularly my immediate family. The next person I'm pointing to is this uh, young woman. This is my mother. My mother at this point in time was approximately 18 or 19 years old. She was at that time a student, and her name was Raisa. Raisa is an ordinary Russian name. I don't think it's of biblical origin, nor did she have a corresponding Hebrew or, or Yiddish name for the reason I mentioned a few minutes ago. And then uh, there were these two younger brothers and these uh, two younger sisters. The two boys were named Alexander and Eugene, once again, Russian or Western names. The two girls were named Julia and no, that's it, Julia. There was no other girl. Altogether, there were eight children, again, belonging to this couple. As was common in those days with high mortality, altogether, in fact, 12 children were born, but four died in infancy, and eight survived. Just as in my father's case, eight children had been born one died in infancy, one was killed in the pogrom, and six survived. Now, who are the other people here? Well, first of all, these three young people were the children of Joseph and his wife, Ida. The oldest of these was Nadia, Nadezhda, who later also, of course, lived in the United States, as did Uncle Joseph's whole family. This was uh, Genia, Eugenia, who died soon after this photo was taken of some illness, which perhaps wasn't even diagnosed properly those days. Lots of children died in those days. And this, as I already mentioned, uh, the baby and the only one surviving is Louis Seichmann. Now, one thing I, I would like to stress before we change pictures is that of this whole group of people, plus all the people in the photo of my father's family that we already seen, all together some 20 or more people, of all these people, a very high proportion uh, did not die a natural death, but died a violent death. I've already mentioned about my father's brother buddies died in the pogrom. The rest died violently uh, thanks to Stalin or Hitler. When Hitler came to power, my grandfather's brother, his wife, their son, who was old enough to be in this photo but for some reason is not, this woman, Adele, and Alexander and Eugene, all died in the Holocaust, as did members of my father's family. This woman's husband, this is Elisabetta, the Elizabeth, my mother's sister, was killed in the war. Well, these are the, those who, in this picture, who died violently. My uncle Joseph and his family, and he eventually had five surviving children, uh, emigrated to the United States rather early, around 1920. He had been trained in Russia, at least, uh, as a pharmacist and worked as a pharmacist in Russia. And then, wherever he went, he worked as a pharmacist, owner of a drugstore later on, although business as a druggist was never very successful and sometimes indeed rather unsuccessful. His brother, Lou Zickman, also began traveling early, indeed much earlier than Joseph. Sometime at the beginning of the First World War, when he was uh, probably just about 30 years old or possibly even a little less than 30 years old, he went to Siberia. He went to Siberia for various reasons. 
One, because Siberia then very thinly populated and not under the pressing burden of the whole legacy of Russia, had a, a freer spirit, a frontier spirit of sorts. It was easier to make money there, and moreover it was easier for a Jew. He would be outside the Pale of Settlement. It was easier for a Jew to live there without being bothered. He was always very adventurous and venturesome. In Siberia, he started working as a traveling salesman for some rich Jewish individuals and firms. And in that capacity, he covered a great deal of Siberia. And later on, he would be fond of telling us stories about Siberia. In 1916, however, he went to an even more distant frontier, namely outside the borders of Siberia and Russia, uh, the frontier of Manchuria, and particularly the city of Harbin, which at that time was just about exactly 20 years old. There was nothing there before 1896. But it uh, received a great boost by being uh, the supply center and command center behind the Russian front during the Russo-Japanese War of 1904-05, a war that the Russians, of course, lost, but Harbin's gain from that, and, uh, of course, its basic position at the juncture of several railroads that uh, the Russians had built in Manchuria, allowed it to go on and become an important commercial center, where, indeed, Uncle Lova, which is what we always call him, and that's what I will continue to call him here on out, Uncle Lova did the best of it. He was always very good in taking advantage of opportunities. He married there, married a Russian woman, not a Jewish woman. And with time, he even established a branch in Japan, in Yokohama. In fact, in September 1923, during the enormous earthquake, he was, uh, on the day of the earthquake, sitting in his office in the port city of Yokohama, right outside Tokyo, when the earth suddenly started giving way and uh, everything started collapsing around him. That did not kill him. Uh, that didn't even do much uh, damage to him physically. What did do damage to him, or at least uh, affected him greatly physically, was the ensuing tsunami, the huge of wave that such earthquakes uh, uh, generate. It came and essentially washed out a large part of the city of Yokohama and my uncle with it, and carried him way into the sea, where after I don't know how many hours he was picked up by Japanese fishermen and brought to land. So as you see, um, the, the concept of the wandering Jew has very many variants. <laughs> Washing out to see Jew. <laughs> <laughs> the washing out to see Jew, that's right. <laughs> that's another story he always told. And I might add here that not because he was saved by Japanese fishermen, but uh, from his early acquaintance with Japan, he always had a very healthy regard for Japanese people. People as people, not Japanese as militarists, not Japanese as uh, m m killers or sadists or murderers or anything, and unfortunately Japanese acted in these capacities as well, but as Japanese as people. You always have good relations with them and uh, a lot of respect for them. Anyhow, 1923 saw another development in the family, another event in the family, and that is the arrival of my parents and myself and Poyla in Harbin. So let me go back to my mother and my father. First, let me mention that my mother received her post-secondary training, or even late secondary and uh, sort of college level training, but it probably was not a full college level training, as a teacher. She went to Kiev, uh, where there was a very progressive teacher school, and studied there. This picture was taken in Kiev. The Russian caption says, the instructors and the students who graduated in the Kiev Froebel Institute. Froebel was a German theorist of education in the early 20th century who developed a lot of uh, progressive and revolutionary ideas about education. 
And he quickly became well-known and very popular in Russia. And the thing to do in Russia is to go to a pedagogical institute which was following the Frevel method. Frevelivsky Institute, as it says here. Anyway, she's somewhere here. I used to know where she was. I think this is my mother. Would you zoom in on her? Yeah. This here? Yeah, I think that's it. Okay. Now we shall look at a number of pictures, uh, mostly of my mother and, uh, and father, some of them possibly before their marriage, which were taken still in Russia before we left for Harbin. This is a picture of my mother and my father. I'm not uh, sure that uh, they actually were married at that time yet. My mother. Okay. Next. Um, yeah. sure. All right. These two uh, young men, boys, are my mother's younger brothers, Eugene and Alexander. Of course, uh, it's a phony setting. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty well done. And uh, next is um, my mother, and as she always described the other girl to me as her closest friend, uh, more or less high school age, both of them. How old was your mother, you think? Uh, mm, I don't know, 16, 17, something like that. Yeah, that's very nice. And this is my father, uh, probably even somewhat younger than high school age, or at, mo at best high school age. Mm -hmm. And here is my father, somewhat older. Okay. This here is, uh, I would guess, some class or part of a class uh, of uh, of my mother's uh, when uh, she was uh, in one of her uh, teachers' colleges. Uh, this is uh, uh, Uncle Grisha, my uh, father's brother and uh, the father of Misha and Lucia. Still, picture still taken in Russia. And here are next uh, the three brothers: my father, Yaakov, Mary's father, and uh, Grisha Gregory. Surely taken before we left uh, for Manchuria. Here again, my mother was uh, a uh, girlfriend of hers. Same one, that one. Same. Possibly. Yes. And this, incidentally, is a duplicate. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. That's a nice picture. It is a nice picture. Something dramatic. It almost looks like actresses or something. Don't they? Here is, here is my mother. Okay. And because of the uh, uh, sealing wax stamp, uh, I suspect it was taken for some official purpose. Mm -hmm. Probably when she was in college or something like that. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, again, are uh, my mother's siblings. Uh, here is Uncle Joseph, Uncle Louis, and this one uh, may be her uncle. This little picture is that of my uh, grandmother, Basia the one that we already saw in the group picture of her family. Uh, as a matter of fact, it may well have been taken from the same negative. When Paula celebrated her 80th birthday here in, uh, in San Francisco, and that was in 1977, what Joan and I did was take this picture and have it professionally enlarged for wall size and give it to her as uh, a present. And it now belongs to one of the Grossman kids, I think. Well, here are uh, my father and uh, his brother, Grisha, Grigori, both young, still in Russia. Here is Grigori again, so, the same age. And that's your mother next to him. And her, my mother, of course, but I th think possibly quite a right. lot later. This may be Grigori, I'm not sure. Yes, this is probably Grigori, 1908 to Meir. Meir is my father's uh, Yiddish and Hebrew name. Myron, Miron in Russian, mm. Myron, but the Hebrew and Yiddish name was Meir, and the word Meir in, means light in, in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. 